are you? How you doing? Good to see you all here. Uh, it's good to see all our friends and the members of the media. How are you guys? Uh, there's a lot of news happening. You guys, you guys always have CPAC when like the news is busting out all over. And I don't know if you missed this because you guys have been busy already getting ready for this, but the Democrats have already started announcing their plans for the 2020 Democratic National Convention. Did you know this? Just this morning. And they're, I mean, they're kind of ahead of the Republicans. It's a little embarrassing. But they're already taking shape, details coming into play, including their theme song. And I can't believe Lady Gaga and Bradley Cooper are going to be singing Shallow. <laughs> Very impressive. Uh, Kim Jong-un was furious, furious just hours ago. You guys saw the sort of big blow up at the summit. Apparently he stormed out. Um, the Trump folks did not have all the details down. That had to button all the, uh, all the details up to get a successful summit. Apparently, Trump's delegation brought him McDonald's, Kim Jong-un, instead of In-N-Out Burger, so he was out. <laughs> Very upsetting there. Uh, look, Reagan walked away from Reykjavik, and Trump walked away in Hanoi, which was the best outcome. Once again, he's doing the right thing for the American people. <laughs> our, um, our friend, uh, and I don't want you to boo when I say someone's name because that's not nice. And you know, conservatives are supposedly not nice people. So we're going to live up to being, being our nice selves. Jim Acosta of CNN. Oh, no, no, no. You guys don't listen. Come on. He's a nice person. Well, he was complaining this morning on television. I know that's kind of not uh, news. But he was complaining that President Trump didn't call on US media at the uh, post-summit uh, presser, and that he only called on the Russian and the Chinese journalists. And I thought to myself, well, that's kind of interesting, but it's kind of sad, because he'd probably get a better shake from the Chinese and the Russian journalists than he would, a little fairer treatment at least. But I thought, that's kind of, I couldn't even believe that. So I said, Jim Acosta, maybe he has a point here. Well, it turns out, I mean, producer just told me he called on ABC, The Washington Post, New York Times, Bloomberg, and NPR. But he just didn't call on Jim Acosta. <laughs> uh, the land of uh, narcissism uh, knows, no, uh, knows no bounds. My friends, uh, I want to talk about where we are right now in America. Because when you look at some of the old predictions, the things that were written and said about what would happen uh, when Donald Trump uh, became president, uh, Paul Krugman, Nobel Prize winning economist, said basically we would enter a period of a global recession. Uh, Bill Kristol, who pretty much gets everything wrong, uh, said that uh, the NAFTA wouldn't go over very well. The NAFTA renegotiation wouldn't, wouldn't go over very well. In fact, we would have a period of uh, turmoil, uh, security problems. It would, it would spur a foreign policy crisis with Mexico. Of course, that didn't happen. Predictions that the, if the president moved the embassy to Jerusalem, there would be unending chaos and unending bloodshed. Of course, there were some difficult days. But overwhelmingly, things have calmed down. Uh, on issue after issue after issue, the so-called experts have either underestimated President Trump or gotten it completely wrong. So my question today is, is there, is there any point in time where these pundits get their pundit card taken away from them? <laughs> I mean, do they ever get deauthorized as, as being experts or pundits if you continually get it wrong? And of course, that's not, just, that's not the case at all. Uh, they will continue to underestimate, and they will continue to forecast the most dire consequences of Donald Trump's economic and foreign policy. I, I've taken the new Democrat Party and the new, new voices in the Democrat Party quite seriously, and I have gotten some blowback for that, uh, including 
my taking seriously and even, even complimenting Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And people say, well, why would, you do, why would you do that? Like, she's a socialist. Well, I do that because in this era of Trump peace and prosperity, which is, I mean, these are the good old days, by the way. It's not going to get, or it's hard to see how it's going to get much more prosperous or much better on a foreign policy, geopolitical level than it is right now. Peace and prosperity. But I take uh, people like AOC seriously because she is the thought leader of the Democrat Party right now. She is. Uh, she says something and pretty much every Democratic uh, presidential hopeful or candidate jumps or they're forced to respond or they say, well, yes, I see her point, but maybe I do it differently. Maybe I do it this way. She is setting the Democrats' foreign policy table. I take that very seriously, and so should you. The Democrat Party of today has moved ever leftward. It is a leftward lurch that we've seen before. I was a kid in the 1970s. I remember uh, distinctly when Vietnam vets were spat upon. I remember sitting in gas lines. I remember 17% interest rates to 19% interest rates. I remember the malaise, the despondency, the pessimism, the hostages in Iran. I remember when you called the Soviet Union an evil empire, the gasps were heard across academia and the liberal foreign policy establishment. They believed you could lull the Soviets into uh, a better understanding or bring them into the global community, not by peace through strength, but by an unending period of detente. Well, in the 70s, we saw that that ultimately, of course, didn't go very well, uh, and Democrats lost three national elections in a row by an astounding margin each time. Bill Clinton comes in and he wins and then he loses. Of course, in midterms, he tacks back to the center. The era of big government was over and the Democrats were back in the driver's seat. But now, we're going back to the 1970s all over again in the Democrat Party. The Democrat Party of today responds to peace and prosperity, 3% uh, GDP, lowest African un un American uh, unemployment in the United States, Latino unemployment all time low, business confidence, optimism. They respond to all of that with socialism. They put their hopes in larger government. They put their hopes in dangling freebies to a new generation that does see you know, student debt and uh, they, they remember that there was a period of time where wages weren't going up. We go back to socialism, putting all our eggs in that basket or hoping that Bob Mueller will, will save us or maybe Michael Cohen or the Southern District of New York. And I look around and I think, guys, how can it be that the Democrat Party, which used to be like all peace loving and you don't want any more wars and you want people to uh, you know, w talk and not fight, which is what Donald Trump is trying to do with North Korea, and now Trump's the problem? I mean, they should be really happy that we have a Republican president who is more interested in making peace when realistic than making war. That is good for all of us, my friends. So today, here we are, the envy of the world, the American economy. We are the strongest economy of all G7 nations. Unbelievable. And yet we're at a point with the Democrats that now Obama, to them, to this new crop, AOC-led Democrats, Obama wasn't left-wing enough for these Democrats. Obamacare didn't go far enough. We now need Medicare for all. The Paris Accords, which obviously Donald Trump 
smartly said no to, but for the left, not radical enough. We need the Green New Deal. Abortions, about a million a year, through most of a pregnancy, that's not enough. Abortion of, of babies in the womb, not enough. Now we've got to wait to uh, terminate, li terminate life after birth. DACA, that's not radical enough. No way, you need voting rights for illegal immigrants, you need to abolish ICE, and you need open borders. Supporting gay marriage, Supreme Court, uh, that's the law of the land. That's not enough for the left. Now it's transgender athletes must compete in girls' sports, high school sports, college sports. And if you disagree with that, you're a terrible, horrible, awful, rotten person. That's where the Democrat Party is today. Martina Navratilova is too conservative for today's Democrat Party. The increase in the minimum wage, that's not good enough. No way, you need wage equality. Even for people who don't want to work. That's my favorite. That's my favorite. And by the way, it's so bad now for the Democrats. They're, they're looking for, they have, they have an identity complex. Now Michelle Obama was, was criticized this week in an op-ed in the New York Times by an uh, Antioch uh, University professor, Antioch College professor. Michelle Obama is being criticized for putting white empathy ahead of racial justice. This is all being done and said in the name of social justice. And what is social justice? It sounds so good. I mean, it's, it's like the coexist bumper stickers. You ever know what that coexist? What does it mean? Well, it's basically a power grab by pickpockets who think they know better how to spend your money than you do. They think, think you're too stupid to make your own decisions. They're smarter. They'll make them better for you. It never works. And it's really, it's going to only ultimately give rise to yet another populist movement. Let's say they have their dream and they get rid of Trump and, and all these socialist policies come into the fore and we really get the, reach that nirvana of, of wage equalization and opportunity equalization and everything supposedly government mandated equal. Well, look around you. It's not like it hasn't been tried before. We have Britain grappling with Brexit. We have the Yellow Vest movement in France. Trudeau up north, Justin Trudeau's glow is dimming. He's in the middle of his own scandal with his former justice minister uh, testifying against him. I believe it was yesterday. He's in trouble. Merkel will be out in a few years. Even in Sweden, the more middle-of-the-road parties are moving to question what happened with this mass migration of refugees that have changed life in Sweden. Bolsonaro in Brazil. Every time socialism, my friends, every time socialism really gets going, it ultimately is rejected by the people because guess what? It doesn't work. Never will, never has. So it's a, it's a weird thing to watch. And I know a lot of people don't like Trump's tweets or he's, they, he says things they don't like or he says things that maybe two days later you think, well, he we could have phrased it differently. I understand that. Everybody has a different approach to politics. The Democrats like Republicans uh, who lose. They love Republicans. Like, oh, so you have Jeff Flake. They love him. You know, they, they love Republicans who either lose or are driven out of office or who trash Trump. If you want to be a winning Republican in the eyes of Democrats or liberals or the social justice warriors, just be a Republican who hates Trump. Then you're the perfect Republican. But unfortunately, there is no constituency, real constituency, for that type of Republican. It di didn't work, doesn't work. So we're in an odd place where the Democrats, under Obama, were about hope and change. And now, it's resistance and revolution. So today, I'm just trying to tell you that this is just a great time to be an American. We are, we are the party of optimism, and happiness. You know, we're a, 
we're a movement of, of free people and free enterprise. We believe skin color should never, ever, ever be a reason for discrimination or mistreatment, ever. We judge people for who they are, what they say, what they represent, and most importantly, what they do. They use skin color as a weapon. And that is being rejected by the American people. People don't like that. They want people to be people and to try to get along better when we can. And we believe in free expression and robust debate. They cling to speech codes and shadow banning and Soros-funded campaigns of silencing. And guess what? They will never, ever, ever silence us. Never. We believe in protecting innocent life. They believe in infanticide. We believe in real results. Their mantra is resistance and revolution. As Reagan said, my old boss, he said, Republicans believe every day is the 4th of July, but Democrats believe every day is April 15th. <laughs> my friends, we are the envy, not of the press corps perhaps, but the envy of the world because of this president's economic policies and his pragmatic, realistic approach to foreign policy. Donald Trump's policies actually work. Democrats and Never Trumps, uh, I think they're Never Trumpers, they yearn for the old GOP of yesterday, uh, the GOP of capitulation and doubling down on, on wars and, and the, the, being the policeman of the world. None of that stuff worked. Might have had noble intentions, but it was, an, it, it was epically failed. With all due respect, policies of bad trade and open borders and, and endless wars led to Obama. It led to Bill Clinton, and we all see that now. This bright beacon of peace and prosperity that we're seeing cannot and must not be allowed to dim. African Americans, Latinos, young people will have more freedom and more economic opportunity in these years than they will have ever had before. If we aren't afraid to preach this everywhere, to stand defiantly against the critics, to stand defiantly, defiantly against those who would demonize you, silence you, take snippets of what you say, beam them all over the internet, call you a racist, call you a xenophobe, call you a misogynist, call you every ist and ism that could come to mind look right back at them and say, you're the real racist. You're the real misogynist. You are anti-women because you think all women have to think like you. <laughs> My friends, this is all up to you. We have to reject the false promise of socialism. All the giveaways never add up. Don't let them take your freedom. Don't let them frighten you from speaking your mind. They have their truths and their falsehoods. We have eternal truths that will never die, that will never burn out, and that will never be extinguished, ever. Your constitutional rights will be lost if you don't stand to defend them. We have a right to be left alone by an ever-intrusive government. And I will tell you this. I will tell you this. I'm not about to kind of relive 1977 and the gas lines and the, and the, and the malaise and the sadness and the, and the lack of optimism. No way. Because putting Elizabeth Warren or Cory Booker or Kirsten Gillibrand or any of the crowd that's going to be running for president in 2020 in charge of our economy, it's like putting Ralph Northam in charge of your local daycare center. Oh. 
Now, I'm like, I'm like, by the way, there are like three screens like flashing red, as if I care. I mean, hello. I mean, right, rules don't matter. You can, there's, what are they gonna do, enforce the border of the, of the red? Uh, I wanna, if you don't mind, I just wanna introduce uh, you to someone, um, and this is, this is kind of why I'm still doing this after all these years, not just to see all of your friendly faces and to be loved by the media establishment, um, but this is really why I'm doing it. Um, I think she's here somewhere. Where is she? This is my daughter, Maria. Uh, this is the future, my friends. Uh, Maria is 13 and a half going on, I don't know, 21. Uh, and she always is like, I'm taller than you, I'm smarter than you, I'm faster than you. And I say, I want you to be all of those things and more than I am. Because our next generation is going to be better than we are. And I want the best for her. Thank you for being here. Thank you for supporting CPAC. And we'll see you next year. Take care. See ya. Yeah. Go this way.